tomorrow. Garner Ted Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Until human nature is changed, we will continue to have every one of the big problems that plague humankind. All away from the population explosion to warfare and the threat of the extermination of the human race. And whether you get down to some of the smaller daily issues that are problems of ours, such as false price tags, sales that aren't really sales, old used automobiles that fall apart before you get them off the lot, people who are shoplifters and the clerks who try to catch them, whether it's the kids stealing marbles in the dime store or the teenagers threatening to hold up the drug store, whether it's the kids who are mainlining H or whether it's the problem of corruption in the local police department or poor education, wherever and whenever and however you want to slice it, you take a look at human nature in action. Vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed, and you will find the cause for the problem. If you remove that cause, then you're going to solve the problem. There is a cause for every effect, and these are effects that we're living with all around us. Whether you're talking about the social problems of racism and segregation and busing and divorce and crime, or the really big, enormous problems of global pollution, the population explosion, and the inability of members of the human race to get along with each other in different languages, religions, and national guises. It's still that criminal human nature in action. The last several times I've been talking about human nature. The fact that it's a crime all by itself. Now, last time, as I was talking about this booklet, The Ten Commandments, I was showing you that... None of you keep what is in this book. Actually, you can read it if you'd like in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 in your Bible. And you can go right down the line and you can ask yourself, do I observe those perfectly? Then you can turn to the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament in Matthew about the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters and read what Jesus said about magnifying that law. And you can ask yourself, do you keep those laws not only in the letter, but do you keep them as he magnified them? One time a fellow went to Jesus and he said, Good sir, you know, good master, what good thing shall I do that I can have eternal life? And here was Jesus' answer, Matthew nineteen seventeen, And he had asked a real honest and sincere question. Christ had been talking about eternal life, about getting into the kingdom of God, and he wanted to know what to do. He said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. It says, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. That's what Jesus said. That's not First Armstrong, uh, 1917. That was there before my father was ever thought of, and before his great-grandfather was ever thought of, and before Columbus ever carted one of these books, clear across the seas, and found a place he thought was on the other side of the world. He probably had a Bible aboard there somewhere. Those were religious people, and they probably didn't read those Bibles very much, so they would have known better about a few things. But, you know, I have no corner on it. You can look it up. There it is. Jesus said, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. So I'm telling you about a booklet which takes each one of the Ten Commandments, enlarges upon them, not from man's point of view, but from what the Bible says in other places in the Bible. We believe the Bible interprets the Bible, that a man doesn't need to. And so it takes all ten of them and shows you where in other parts of the Bible those ten are magnified as people disobeyed them and broke them and the penalties that were required and as people in some occasions did obey them and the blessings that came their way as a result. It's free of charge and no price. Yes, the Ten Commandments are extant. They are in force, whether we know it or not. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. And the Ten Commandments are a law against human nature. They really are. Because you, of and by your own nature, cannot keep them. Now, herein is the enigma. Jesus said, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Yet you cannot keep them perfectly of and by yourself. You can't do it. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is simple. You need help. You need help that you can't have normally and naturally. You need help that comes from an outside source of which many people know very little. Now let me define it this way. Right in your room, there are many, many wavelengths. You're listening to many, many sounds without realizing it because your ears are limited. And if you're tuned in just to one wavelength right now and receiving a certain broadcast wavelength, and you're hearing my voice, you're hearing me talk about these things, 
But there are many, many other voices that are available. If you just tune the dial a little bit and switch around a little bit, you'd find other voices there. Well, really, if you had a kind of a set where you could tune into the ship to shore and uh, even to the police calls and so on, there are hundreds. And if you could get HF and VHF and UHF and so on, you'd hear military aviation, commercial aviation, private aviation, literally hundreds and hundreds of sounds and voices that permeate the environment where you are. At the moment, you're only tuned in to one of them. Thankfully, you can't hear more than one at a time. Well, if you've got two radios, you can, but then that would just be confusing. You wouldn't be getting very much out of it. But you know, God Almighty, by the power of His Spirit, and this is only by way of analogy. I'm not saying He does it this way, because I don't know how He does it. I just know that He does do it. He, in a sense, broadcasts on His wavelength. That is, that God will reach your mind where you are. You know, Jesus really believed what he said about a divine, all-wise creator God who knows so much that he knows you. He knows your thoughts, your instincts, your inclinations, your inner hopes and dreams. He knows what you think. Oh, I know, that's hard for people to believe. Of course, you believe in a lot of things you can't see and things that are way beyond your ken, your understanding, your comprehension, and so do I. But somehow we balk about when it comes to believing about God. Well, God says, I know, I know, easy there now. He says, you're carnal-minded. You can't help it. I made you that way for a great purpose. If you're willing to discover what that purpose is, you can have your carnal mind changed, but you've got to tune in to his wavelength. There were a group of people standing around who heard a very powerful sermon by the Apostle Peter who had blood guiltiness on their hands. They had been zealots. They were religiously zealous about what they had intended doing, and they thought they had just gotten through ridding the world of a potential upstart who was trying to overthrow the existing government, maybe get the Jewish people of that time in terrible trouble with the Roman government, or maybe start some competing religious or maybe political organization, and they had rid the world of this terrible human being. They'd put him to death. They heard Peter say some very shocking things, and it really got them right down to the innermost part of their being. And they were so terrified, they asked Peter, Oh, no, you know, now we've had it. Now what will we do? And Peter had an answer, and it's the same answer that God will give you right now today. <laughs> In this age of space flight and the mushroom cloud, young people are searching for meaning in life. They've turned to drugs for escape and found their effect is only temporary. They've gone to Eastern philosophies, Buddhism, yoga, astrology, trying to find answers in the meditation and mysticism of the Orient. And now they're even looking at portions of the Bible and turning on with Jesus. Thousands claim to have at last found meaning in life, an ideal to live for. The Jesus trip is in. It's now. But is it right? Truly, there is only one way. But have these young people found it? The free booklet, The Real Jesus, will show you who Jesus Christ truly was, what he said and taught, how he lived, with proof from your Bible. Write for and read The Real Jesus. Send your request to Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO Sydney, New South Wales. That's Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO Sydney, New South Wales. This is the very first sermon that was ever preached, as a matter of record, in the New Testament after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The very first recorded sermon in the entire history of the New Testament church. And the very root and the core of the subject was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the appeal to action at the end of this sermon is what Peter said to those people when they had been deeply shaken, when their consciences bothered them to the point they felt blood guilty. They said, what shall we do? At the conclusion of Peter's powerful and inspired message. You'll find in Acts 2 and verse 38 what Peter said to them. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I know the old King James 16:11 said ghost because they believed in them, but the Greek word really means spirit in the way we understand it today. He said virtually the same thing 
with a slightly different word which helps to clarify the meaning over in verse 19 of the third chapter of the book of Acts where he said the same thing again. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. All right. Repent. What does repentance mean? I've seen dozens of altar calls. And almost never have I heard it put just the way Peter did. Almost never do I hear someone say, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then painstakingly go through it just the way Peter did and Paul did. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, it says. You are bought with a price. You are not your own, it says. That's in the book, you know. It says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what the Bible says, Romans 12, 1 and 2. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It says, we have the mind of Christ. So here's what I'm talking about. Human nature is vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed. It's like an ugly, gnarled, ingrown toenail. It's an ingrown innately selfish, cantankerous, hard-headed, stiff-necked, rebellious attitude toward God. Often by itself, it's criminal. It's against the law, God's law. But God is seeking to change human nature. And Jesus Christ of Nazareth showed that it can be changed. He came to denature human nature, to change it. It's easier to denature plutonium, as has been said by a leading scientist, than it is to change human nature. But many men, statesmen, and leaders have acknowledged that unless or until human nature is changed, we shall continue to have war and all the other big problems that plague humankind. There's a way you can have your nature changed, but it takes your cooperation and your willingness. You can't do it as long as you're stiff-necked and rebellious against God. If and when you will listen to God's call, if God is choosing you, of course, there's nothing you can do about it, then he's going to get you anyhow. And that's going to be good for you, because there are many that are called, you know, and few that are chosen. There are some who are chosen, are virtually yanked into God's work, whether they want to be or not. Jeremiah was. He said, I'm too young. I can't preach. And God just said, no, don't say that. You're going to do it anyhow. Isaiah said, I don't want to preach this message. I'm a young guy of real unclean lips. I'm just a, a commoner. How can I do that? And God said, don't worry about it. I've sanctified you for this special calling. You're going to do it whether you like to or not. You know, the story of Jonah, of course, who ran away. And God yanked him back by a set of very strange circumstances and made him carry the message whether he wanted to or not. Every one of the apostles who became apostles were called in spite of themselves, not because of themselves. They weren't invited. They were drafted. You can find in the Old Testament prophecies there isn't a single prophet in your Bible who volunteered for the job. No matter the way they tell it to you today, that's not my fault. I'd rather tell it the way it is, and if you find me make a mistake, take it up with me. That's fine. I said, prove it. Prove me now herewith. The Bible says, prove all things I say, don't believe me, or a word I say, unless you check it and prove it in your Bible. So there are many who are called. A call does go out. I firmly believe every single time this program is on the air, a call goes out in a sense, or every single time you read a book with a magazine, every single time somebody picks up a Bible or walks past one, as far as I'm concerned, there's a call there. There can be many ways in which people can be called, and it can kind of happen through a set of circumstances. Won't you open your mind and, and just toy with the idea for a few minutes, hey, you know, maybe I could have been wrong about something once. You know, you hear people tell the story, I thought I was wrong once, then I thought about it a while and discovered I wasn't. We really are that way, deep down inside, for all of the jokes we tell about it. One of the most difficult things for you to do is to admit when you have been wrong. To see it really is the most difficult, isn't it? To come to see that you've been wrong and to have the cold shower of the shock of saying, I've been wrong inside yourself, to yourself, is even more difficult. But then to admit it to others... Well, that's the supreme sacrifice. It's demanded of human nature, I guess, to admit you have been wrong about something. And yet that's what repentance means. It means to admit deeply inside yourself and to your God that you have been deeply wrong in your attitude, your entire approach to life, and your approach to God and to his word. To repent, then you go do something. Baptize. Well, what does that mean? 
has a separate subject and a very big one. It means what it says, of course. Baptizo in the Greek language meant to plunge into. It talked about where John the Baptist was at a certain place along the River Jordan where much water was. It talked about Jesus coming up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. It talks about people here, mature adults, who had deep pangs of conscience, who said, what can we do? And Peter said, you'd better go be baptized after you repent. It showed this in the case of the Apostle Paul, one case after another. So you see, when you look into what the Bible says about baptism, that's a mature adult decision to go through a formal ceremony which implies the death of the old carnal nature, the death of one's old attitudes, his whole approach and his way of life. The burial of that old self, this time just a quick plunge into water. But it's symbolic, deeply symbolic, of the death and burial of the old self. And coming up out of the water instantly is symbolic of the hope of the resurrection. That's what the Bible teaches, and it's so simple, it's so plain. I've seen cases where there was one case I remember clear back, oh, it must have been in the 50s somewhere in New York City, where on a real hot day, a, uh, an evangelical type was out. He whipped the people all up to giant excitement. He had a permit from the city fire department, and they had a hose out there, and they had all these people in the street, and they sprayed them with a fire hose and called that baptism. Now, I'm not questioning their right to do that. I'm not questioning anybody's right to diving into a damp sponge off a 40-foot tower and calling it baptism, if that's what he'd like to call it. People have the right to be wrong. They've got the right to make a mistake. They've got the right to be sincere in doing it. But uh, that's a perversion of God's Word. So don't get mad at me. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says, because that is the easiest job that I know of. It is so easy to say, here's what the Bible is about to say, then tell you what the Bible says, and then tell you what the Bible said. But it seems to me it's so difficult to sit around and argue about why the Bible doesn't mean what it says. It must drive you up the walls, reading something, it just socks you right in the face, tells you exactly what it means, and then sit there and fight with it, argue with it, and try to rationalize and spiritualize around to get other people to believe that it means the precise opposite of what it says. Your human nature needs to be changed, and so does mine. The only way to get them changed is to repent, be baptized, and be converted. And that changes you as much as the conversion of anything changes it. It's a total change that is required. The splendor of kings has awed man for thousands of years. Every kingdom, whether despotic or benevolent, has four important aspects. Its ruler subjects, laws, and territory. Bible prophecies foretell a kingdom that will rule the whole world with the laws of God as its guide. It's called the kingdom of God. Some say it's the church. Others are sure that it's set up in the hearts of men, and many insist it's in heaven. But what does the Bible say? Where will it be, and how will it be set up? The booklet titled, What Do You Mean, Kingdom of God?, brings you the answer from your Bible. Write to your free copy today and read the big news about what do you mean, Kingdom of God. Send your request to Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO Sydney, New South Wales. Again, that's Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO Sydney, New South Wales. You can look at any problem that we could talk about which I would like to do little by little and gradually in this series of programs, and you can see human nature behind it, if you're willing to view that human nature from what the Bible says about it, then your understanding of the problems around you will increase enormously. You know, even David said that because he knew God's law, he had more intelligence than his own teachers. It wasn't a boast on his part. He said that his meditation all the day long was God's law, and he said the acknowledgement, the awareness of God's law in action as it is applied and as it exposes human nature made him to know more than all of his teachers who were older and wiser, more experienced than he. This is the kind of knowledge that is a basic knowledge that is not technical knowledge. There are many kinds of knowledge that I know nothing about whatsoever. They could lead me into the telephone office where you live, I suppose, and say, okay, fix that, and I'd say, go ahead, shoot me. I mean, depending on what the penalty is, I'm lost. I wouldn't know what on earth to do. There are so many different aspects of this modern technological age in which we live that are very, very hard for me to figure out. 
But there are some basic things that I can learn. Not because of myself, but in spite of myself. And there is such a thing as revealed knowledge. And the only way you are going to ever really have your mind opened and be able to comprehend some of the virtually incomprehensible problems around you in all of society, in all of the world, is by asking God Almighty to give you a little bit of his wavelength. Tune into his wavelength. It takes the process of asking yourself, could you have been wrong? Is there anything you need to repent of? Have you ever sinned? If you have, your sin will catch up with you. It will, as the old preacher used to say, find you out. Well, the Bible says that some men's sins are open beforehand and others they follow after. But the point is, the Bible says all have sinned. And the Bible tells you what sin is. I don't care what the preacher types tell you. The Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. That's what it says, 1 John 3, 4. You can read it with your own eyes. The Bible gives you a definition of what is sin, breaking the Ten Commandments. Well, I've proved to you already that the carnal nature does that, because Romans 8, 7 says it does. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to his law. Now, if it's not subject to his law, it's breaking his law. That's what the Bible says. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what do you do about it? You repent. It's that simple. And your nature begins to be changed. It becomes a different nature. And jealousy is replaced by generosity, and hatred by love, and strife by a feeling of mercy and wanting to share, and competition by the desire to give and an outgoing concern. And your very nature begins to be completely and totally changed from a man nature of carnality, jealousy, vanity, hatred, racism, spite, and kind of the bitterness of spirit into a feeling of love toward neighbor, love even toward enemies, a feeling of joy and happiness, a feeling of well-being that flows through your entire being and that there are no words to really describe. Is this some kind of a pull yourself up by your own bootstrap philosophy kind of thing so you can go around through the day whistling yourself no matter what the problems? No, that would be a useless exercise in a lot of psychology if there were no God. But since there is a God, what I'm telling you is the way to get in contact with that God and have that God open your mind, which you can't do for yourself. Now, of course, if God isn't working with you, whoever and wherever you are, and my words are going off your head just like water off a duck's back, and my job's done where you're concerned because you've heard it and what you do with it, it's up to you. But, you know, it takes a miracle from God to open a human's mind, but it takes our cooperation. Human nature is at the root of the whole problem. Next time I'll show you how even in the problem of pollution that human nature is the culprit in factories, in advertising, in the pollution all around us, human nature is the culprit. It will crop up every single time. But you ought to write for these booklets the Ten Commandments and Why Were You Born? And also write for The Wonderful World Tomorrow, What It Will Be Like. This booklet is one that is, I think, more than any other, a booklet that explains all about these programs. It tells you, in a nutshell, exactly what the World of Honor program is all about. It tells you exactly what we believe, what we expect, what we hope, what we're part of, what we're doing, what we're trying to tell this world. It's all in this one booklet about the wonderful world tomorrow, what it will be like. It's absolutely free of charge. Let me tell you a little bit about the booklet. It's, it's not a large booklet, yet it's fairly thick. It's nearly 100 pages long. Uh, it is fairly heavily illustrated. There are many chapters I'd like to tell you about. The entire point of it is that today the world is in chaos. The world is in political ferment. The world is filled with about 94% of all the populace of this earth sharing 50% of its wealth, while the other 6%, as you've heard me say so often, are wallowing in the other half of it. There is a threat of human extinction that is always off there somewhere on the horizon. What about a coming United States of Europe? What will really occur? Well, this booklet, The Wonderful World Tomorrow, shows you the widely divergent ideas of what most world leaders expect. Now, philosophers, statesmen, many others have thought this world is on the brink of extinction. Scientists the world over have issued some very frightening warnings about depletion of natural reserves about what they call non-renewable resources. You will see in this booklet, right at the beginning of it, these two opposites of how science on the one hand plans for the future, a highly automated, 
unbelievable kaleidoscopic, glittering technological dream world of tomorrow with everybody using laser rays and helicopters and spaceships, as opposed to the serious, calculated ideas of other scientists that wonder whether the world can stand any more of this technological impact. It goes into the social order, into commerce and industry. Just a brief chapter on each one, only a couple of pages. And it shows you that there is good news, there is hope. Let me tell you this, people have said time and again that I preach, I talk about the end of the world. It wasn't, I think it was only a few weeks ago, a newspaper columnist asked me, uh, was I preaching about the end of the world? And I said, absolutely not. And they thought I was lying. I said, no, I've never preached about the end of the world. And then I explained. I said, look, Jesus talked about the end of the world, didn't he? Well, yes. Well, did you know that he spoke in Greek? Or Aramaic, as the case may have been. He spoke both, plus he also spoke Hebrew. Well, he used the term aeon for age, or the word cosmos in the Greek language, which means society. Now, Jesus did talk about the dawn of a new age, and I don't mean Aquarius. He talked about the end of man's present way of life on this earth and the new horizon, the new dawning of a new age on beyond this present time. And that's what this booklet is about, looking toward a world that is not yet here. When you look at the signs of our times in which we're living right now, the only way you can understand it is that this world cannot go on in the way that it is today very much longer. It cannot maintain this disequilibrium between this peace which seemingly cannot be achieved and a war, a great ultimate climactic war, which cannot be fought and go along with these massive social disorders and these problems just forever and ever and ever. So this booklet shows you what is in the immediate offing. How there is a pattern of government organization that has already been planned. A master plan for re-educating, for rehabilitating the world. The distribution of populations around the world. Believe it or not, one world language, one world government, one world religion. I've talked continually about whether or not the dream of many nations of the creation of an ultra-national or supranational world force, one world government, would ever be possible. And I've shown that in the hands of man it would not be, that it would be an absolute nightmare that you couldn't begin to envision a world government in the hands of man or any collection of men. But this booklet shows you it's going to be taken out of the hands of man. It takes a look at past attempts of human beings to create various supranational governments. We began with the League of Nations. Now we have the United Nations. They have proved that they are unable to stop wars. They are unable to prevent wars. They are unable to stop one once it gets started short of the desire of the participating parties to do so. But you need to write for this booklet, The Wonderful World Tomorrow, and see why it is going to take supernatural force to bring about the salvation of humankind. I'm not talking now about a great combined effort, let me make it clear, of evangelical organizations to get people to believe on Christ, which saves the world. I'm not talking about that kind of salvation. I don't mean saved dead. I mean saved alive. You don't want to be saved dead. You want to be saved alive, don't you? You know, when you stop thinking about it, wouldn't it be great if God had come along and said, I have a plan whereby you don't need to die. You don't have to die and then go somewhere. You can just, if you'll believe what I say and accept what I have for you, and pray to me and talk to me about it, then I can give you life and, and change you so you'll go right on and be perpetually young. So remember this book, It's a Wonderful World Tomorrow, about 100 pages long approximately, full color, free of charge, graphically illustrated, tells you more than any other book that can exactly what this program is all about, what we believe, what we're trying to accomplish. Write for it right away. Before you forget it, jot the address down, get the letter off right away today. Don't put it off, you might forget it till tomorrow. And this booklet needs to be in the mail to you as soon as we can get it on its way. And all you need to do is to request it by sending your letter to Post Office Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales. Be sure to tell us the call letters of your station. We need that. That's all. There is no cost, but tell us the name of the radio station to which you've been listening, the call letters, and then send your letter to Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales. Until next time, this is Garner Ted Armstrong saying goodbye, friends. You have been listening to The World Tomorrow. If you would like more information, write to Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO Sydney, New South Wales. That's Ambassador College, Box 345, GPO Sydney, New South Wales. <laughs>
Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.